Hello, everyone. Welcome at the um, Center for Theoretical Physics uh, seminar. Today, we have a pleasure to host um, Professor Ariel Katicha from State University of New York at Alpine. The talk is fully, as you can see, the, the, the talk is fully online. Professor Katicha is, is in the US, and we will have a lecture today on a, a non-orthodox approach to, to uh, derivation or reconstruction of uh, quantum mechanics. Uh, which is called uh, anthropic uh, dynamics, which has been developed by by uh, Professor Katicha. And uh, well, I'm very much looking forward to uh, hear the the details. Ariel, the ground is yours. Thank you very much for for the invitation. It's it's always a pleasure to 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 get to share uh, the kind of stuff I do. So my talk will be on quantum mechanics, uh, the anthropic dynamics approach. This is a somewhat uh, strange way to do quantum mechanics, but uh, well, you know, quantum mechanics is strange. So, so we should be prepared. Uh, I would like to start by, by acknowledging the, a bunch of people, um, students, collaborators, uh, who have worked on, on many of these aspects uh, over the years. Um, doing this kind of research uh, involves, to a large extent, uh, doing all sorts of wrong things, and then eventually figuring out the right way to do it. And uh, and they, these guys helped me a, a lot to to pursue this program. So the presentation is based on 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 a few papers that uh, that are in the in the archive. Um, but if you want uh, more reading, the papers, lectures, uh, and even some some videos, uh, my my website has a, a good a good way to look at those things. Very good, so let's start. The subject. The subject is quantum mechanics. Uh, the goal here is to derive, or to use the modern word term for it, to reconstruct the mathematical formalism. Uh, in the traditional approach, the Hilbert space takes priority. It comes first. And uh, then there are a number of questions that we can always ask, like uh, why are there probabilities in the first place? Why quantum probabilities? Uh, where does the Born rule come from? Uh, why is it that one has two forms of uh, temporal evolution, linear unitary evolution and the way function collapse? So th th this, th these are questions that have been around like forever. And uh, they, they, for the most part in the 20th century, they were hidden by the fact that quantum mechanics is just so successful. Uh, but the ultimate question that arises in all of this is what does quantum mechanics say about the world? What's real? Um, what's ontic in quantum mechanics? What belongs in the, with the ontology? And what's epistemic in quantum mechanics? Uh, those are distinctions that uh, are, are, are basic to the whole thing. And of course, different interpretations of quantum mechanics offer different answers. So what we're following here is, uh, is a separate and alternative approach in which it is probability that comes first. This is a theory of inference. And there, the questions that we, we ask are different. We ask a set, different set of questions. We ask, why do we have wave functions in a probabilistic theory? Uh, why do we have complex numbers? Why is the unitary evolution, well, what is the evolution linear and unitary? Where do Hilbert spaces come from? So this is going to be our goal, to try to, to, to derive uh, many of these features from uh, presumably basic assumptions. Of course, uh, what counts as basic or not basic is, is uh, very much up for, well, personal taste, but here we go. So uh, the talk will have a few parts. The, in the first part, we're going to discuss entropic dynamics in a, in a generic general uh, form. Uh, then we're going to recognize that theories of inference do not contain a notion of time. Uh, we can make inferences about the future just as well as one can make inferences about the present or the past. So the issue there is going to be try to be uh, particularly explicit about what do we mean by time. Uh, 
Finally, we're going to introduce the additional assumptions that will make the entropic dynamics uh, into quantum mechanics. So here we go. Uh, the goal here is to predict the positions of particles. We can develop the same formalism of entropic dynamics to, to discuss fields, but I'm not going to do it here. So this talk will be restricted to uh, non-relativistic quantum mechanics. We're going to start by saying, and, and this is this is one of the very, very basic assumptions we're going to make, is that particles have definite but unknown positions to be inferred on the basis of relevant information and expressed in forms of constraints. So, so let, let's unpack what it is that's there, because there is a lot of stuff there. Definite positions. Uh, this means that this theory is in complete disagreement with, for example, the Copenhagen interpretation. When I say that the particle goes through one slit or the other in a double slit experiment, I mean it. Uh, in this sense, this theory is more similar to, say, the Bohmian interpretation. Particles have definite positions, but the positions are unknown. So this is why we introduce probabilities to describe our uncertainties over the probability the particles might be located. Uh, these unknown positions will be inferred. This is what makes it a theory of inference on the basis of relevant information. This is where we put the physics of the problem. And this information will be expressed in the form of constraints. This is where entropy comes in. We're going to be maximizing an entropy subject to physical information contained in constraints. Uh, the fact that we have constraints here means that we have to introduce uh, yet another set of variables in order to mm, describe this information. So here we're going to introduce a potential phi that's going to play three separate roles, perhaps unexpected, but phi will represent or describe, will be used to describe the constraints on the basis of which we find the probability row. That's the first role, it's the constraints. Second, uh, our generalized coordinates in this um, in this dynamics, our generalized coordinates rho uh, are the probabilities. We are going to need another kind of quantity that represents the associated conjugate momenta. That's phi. And finally, we're going to see, as one might expect, that rho will describe the magnitude of the wave function, while phi will correspond to the phases of the wave function. So it's going to be constraints, conjugate momenta, and uh, phases. That's what phi will play. But at this point, we just have rho and perhaps constraints, and we'll discuss that next. So here goes a generic form of entropic dynamics. We are going to assume, and this is important physical information, that motion is continuous. The motion of particles is continuous. And uh, therefore, that it can be analyzed in a sequence of short steps. Not much different than when Newton tried to analyze the trajectory of a particle in terms of a bunch of short steps. Analyzing in terms of short steps is a tremendous uh, simplification on anything we do. So. We're going to try to figure out the transition probability from one position to a neighboring one. That's the part that we can actually do pretty easily. So let's do that. We're going to find that transition probability by maximizing an entropy. Here you see a relative entropy uh, of a potential posterior, the probability of transition from x to x prime, relative to a prior distribution. This prior distribution. Excuse uh, me. Yes, that's, sure. That's not entropy. That's a curve. This is a Kullback function. Well, yes, it's a relative entropy. Yeah, uh, well, it is, so it, it's not entropy because entropy has to be additive, and that quantity is not additive. Of course, but, it is. No, because it is only depending on log of q, depending on what is p and q. But if these are this, the, this, if these this, are the probabilities in a normal... Q, Q is fixed in this problem. We're going to maximize this 
entropy, relative entropy, in order to find the, I think we're just quibbling about the name. I like to call this entropy because uh, in the case when Q is constant, it reproduces statistical mechanics. And otherwise it serves to update from the distribution Q to the distribution P, which will be the posterior. So I'll continue. Uh, the distribution Q is going to represent what uh, all these short steps have in common. So here we go. What do we choose for this uh, prior distribution? Uh, the prior distribution, we will assume it to be minimally informative, is what all steps have in common. True, it will describe short steps. But apart from that, it will include no directionality and no correlations. Uh, the distribution that manages to accomplish that can also be obtained by maximizing an entropy, and perhaps not surprisingly, is something that is described by a Gaussian distribution. Uh, here we have a probability distribution that is a product of Gaussians. Um, the index A will uh, represent the coordinates of, this, uh, of the particles. The index N will re uh, represent which particle we're talking about. You see that this is quadratic in delta X in the displacement. You also see that there is a Kronecker delta, that's the metric of Euclidean space. And uh, here we have, um, so, so you have a bunch of uh, La uh, Lagrange multipliers, one corresponding to each particle. So we really have a, a product of Gaussians. It's spherically symmetric, no directionality, no correlations. And in order to describe short steps, we are going to take the Lagrange multiplier alpha to go to infinity. This will guarantee that whatever probability we have of jumping from X to X prime will only uh, be appreciable when the delta X is small. So that's a prior. How about the constraint now? What is it that makes one step different from the next one? The main constraint. We are going to introduce through this main constraint uh, directionality of the motion we're going to introduce correlations. Uh, this is where so much of the quantum mechanical stuff really enters, like mm, eventually tunneling and, and uh, <coughs> interference. <coughs> so we're going to introduce a potential, which here, for reasons that will become clearer later, I call the drift potential. Um, those of you who are familiar with, say, Nelson's stochastic mechanics, um, some of these terms will will uh, will become will be familiar to you, although the physical interpretation ends up being uh, rather different at times. Uh, here we go. So this drift potential is a function in configuration space. Here we have the capital N particles, and we're going to call that potential phi of x. And uh, as for the main constraint, there will be one constraint for the whole system. And the constraint is going to be that the expected value taken over that transition probability of this potential uh, is just some small constant. I'm going to rewrite this constraint as just by doing the Taylor expansion of this small change of the potential. Here we go. We differentiate with respect to x and multiply by the delta x and take the expected value. So this is the basic constraint that we're going to use in order to figure out the, prob the transition probability. Now, uh, at this point, of course, you're going to be a little bit nervous because you say, where does this come from? And uh, that's perfectly legitimate. Uh, basically, we're trying to capture what is the, the, the information that is relevant uh, in order to reproduce those results that we know. This constraint does it. The amusing thing is that imposing this constraint will lead us to things such as, oh yes, this phi here will eventually be uh, the phase of the wave function. It is a conjugate momentum. It has a number of other justifications that will become apparent uh, soon enough. So here we go. We maximize that entropy subject to normalization uh, with that prior and with this constraint. Um, yes, yes, a uh, remark here on this, um, 
on this uh, function here that expresses the, the constraint. This is a function that's local in three n dimensions in configuration space, but it is automatically highly non-local in three dimensional space. So you can see where it is that some of the features of quantum mechanics start showing up already by design from the beginning. So here we go. That's the transition probability. Um, you can see that here is the prior, it's a bunch of Gaussians, and there is a single constraint for the drift potential with its Lagrange multiplier alpha prime. And we, there we have the other Lagrange multiplier uh, alpha n. At this point, we're not given any physical interpretation of which Lagrange multipliers uh, might be. They're just there. We'll figure them out in a little while. So what do we, can we say from this uh, Gaussian probability distribution? A generic displacement can be written in terms of an expected value, as we can always do with Gaussians, uh, plus some kind of fluctuation. And uh, from this Gaussian expression, we can read what this expected value is going to be. It has to do with the linear terms that appear here towards the end. And uh, it's going to be something like this. The, the, the displacement is going to be uh, related to the gradient of that potential. And uh, the fluctuations, we can read them from the quadratic part, uh, are going to be given by mm, one over the Lagrange multiplier multiplied by the uh, metric tensor. Uh, I beg your pardon. Yes. Uh, this probability, uh, this is the result of the entropy maximization, or this comes from the assumptions? No, 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 no. This is this is the result of having maximized this entropy. Okay. With okay. This prior with this prior to that constraint. Yes. 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 Okay. So that's the result of the of the maximization. Okay. Correct. Okay. Correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. And and in the end, this is why this is an entropic dynamics because with this uh, without this transition probability for short steps, you cannot do anything. So 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 this is a good chunk of why we call this an entropic dynamics. Uh, so here we go. We have that transition probability. Now, remember why we were doing this transition probability? What we had was the trajectories of particles are continuous, uh, but being continuous, we can analyze them in terms of short steps. This is the probability of one short step. So what we would like to do next is we want to iterate these steps see how these steps accumulate. That's where we introduce an idea, a new idea, in order to keep track of the accumulation of many short steps. I'm going to call this time, but at this point, it is not at all obvious that this is anything to do with time, because after all, Inferences can go into the past, into the future, and so on and so forth. So, so here I'm going to have to be very explicit about the various assumptions I have to make in order to justify giving these things the name time. And then at the very end, I'm going to come back and say, OK, how is this object here connected to the actual notion of a physical time? But for now, it's just something we introduce in order to accumulate the to, to take keep track of the accumulation of short steps. Uh, the first thing, the first ingredient in, in, in introducing this notion of entropic time is we're going to introduce the notion of an instant. And the way we do it is we say, look, consider uh, the joint probability of x and some other position. And uh, of course, we can always express that joint probability in terms of a product, using the product rule, using conditional probabilities. And uh, we can even go ahead further and marginalize over the probability of x, and we get an equation of this type. Now, an equation of this type uh, contains no physics. Uh, this is just a consequence of universal uh, laws of probability theory. So, so what do we do with this? 
Here we do the physics. We say, look, if this probability Px was the probability distribution for the particles at one instant, and P of x prime given x is the transition probability in a short step, I'm going to construct the next instant with this formula, with this equation. You can see it's Markovian. You can see it has a nice of in, a, a bunch of interesting features. But please notice that it is in saying these words, this is the probability distribution at one instant. Then we take a short step. And then that's the next instant. This is the kind of equation that allows me to construct time instant by instant. And I'm going to rewrite that equation in terms of the probability at time t, the transition probability, and then the probability uh, a little bit later, to the extent that the transition probability describes short steps. This gives me an instant, the following instant. Now, it turns out, and this is the second ingredient for being capable of calling this time, it turns out that these instants are ordered. And uh, you can see that from the fact that this transition probability was obtained maximizing entropy. If I were to switch the two um, arguments here and call this the probability of x given x prime, that probability distribution would not be given by uh, maximizing an entropy. Instead, it would be given related to this one through a Bayes theorem. So, so clearly, there is a natural order in going from x to x prime that's provided by the fact that we are maximizing an entropy. So in this kind of dynamics, there is a natural arrow of this uh, entropic time. So that's the second ingredient. We have instants and they are ordered. Finally, <coughs> we would like to discuss the separation between successive uh, instants. So the notion of duration will be introduced, I would say, sort of like in the standard way, uh, in such a way that motion looks simple. Uh, if you recall from the previous slides, the motion was described from the, those Gaussians uh, in terms of the expected displacement in a short step and the fluctuations uh, that you expect. So what we would like to be able to see, to say now is, what are those Lagrange multipliers? How would they be connected with the notion of time? This is where we define time in ten terms of the Lagrange multipliers, or alternatively, uh, define the Lagrange multipliers in terms of time. So we wanted the alpha, which is the Lagrange multiplier that guarantees short steps, to be large. So what we're going to say is that alpha is related to time uh, in this form, 1 over delta t, that makes life very easy. We are defining duration so that motion looks as simple as possible. And then there will be some other constants, Cn, that depend on the particle. So apart from constants that are particle dependent, the alpha is going to be 1 over delta t. That guarantees that alpha is large and simplifies the motion. In this version, uh, well, I would like to rewrite these constants in terms, well, in a, in, a, in, a, in a way that doesn't make any difference. I just rename the constant Cn as m sub n. Uh, and uh, eventually, the reason I do it is that eventually we're going to recognize that this constant Cn end, end up being the masses of the particles. Of course, at this point, we do not know that. We just recognize that the particles are different, and uh, they come with different Lagrange multipliers. The other constant that appears here, eta, is something that is introduced for mm, future convenience. It makes sure that delta t has units of seconds and m has units of mass and things like that. So it's not particularly crucial. Very good. So this takes care of one of the Lagrange multipliers. The other Lagrange multiplier that we have to worry about is the alpha that appears over there. 
and uh, you may not. We're going to choose alpha to be to be a constant. Uh, that's not too difficult to see from here that uh, whatever the drift potential was, uh, where we to multiply it by by constants, it wouldn't make much of a difference. So the pos simplest possible thing that we can do here is just choose it to be a constant. But that's not completely arbitrary either. We are choosing the finding duration so that motion looks simple. If we choose the alpha to be a constant, then what we have for the displacement, expected displacement, is that the displacement inherits time from this uh, Lagrange multiplier alpha over here. And so that the displacement is proportional to delta t. So what this means is we are defining the Lagrange multipliers in order that there is a well-defined probability velocity. This is this equation here. We can actually do the ratio of those two. We have a velocity. And in such a way that the fluctuations are a measure of time. The system is its own clock. Its fluctuations measure time. Its drift measure time. Uh, since this is quadratic in the fluctuations and linear in the displacement, you can really see that this is like a drift. And, uh, and this is like the fluctuations you expect in a Brownian motion. So if you are familiar with the stochastic mechanics of Nelson, these are uh, similar to the results that he obtained uh, there in stochastic mechanics. Of course, Nelson had background uh, influences that were causing this Brownian motion. We have absolutely none of that. It's just uh, incorporating uh, the physical information contained in these drift potentials into a maximum entropy calculation. So this is Brownian motion. It is not quantum mechanics. Uh, whenever you do a maximum entropy calculation and you do not get the probability distributions that uh, are correct, you have several possibilities. One of them is that, oh, maybe you chose the wrong variables, or most likely you chose the wrong uh, constraints. So what is it that we have done here that does not smell so right? Well, I would claim that as far as short steps, there is nothing wrong here. But when we try to accumulate these short steps, we're going to see that this is just a diffusion process it's not yet quantum mechanics. So how do we accumulate? Now that we have this notion of time, how do we accumulate these short displacements, these short steps? So here we go. We have expressed the basic law of an entropic dynamics first in integral form. That's what we have just seen. But we can rewrite this integral form uh, in differential form. Uh, the result is a differential equation in the form of a continuity equation. Here we have a divergence. The index capital A is supposed to indicate both the, the particle and its coordinates. So we have here a divergence in four dimensional, uh, in three n dimensional space. Config, uh. Uh, it takes the form of a Fokker Planck equation. So this is really like a diffusion process. Uh, the velocity that appears here can be written, just this is, you can just derive it uh, from that uh, transition probability, can be written as uh, the gradient of that, uh, of a drift potential. The coefficients are like the inverse of the mass tensor. Uh, and this new uh, phi that I have written here is the old phi that describes the gradient of the curly phi describes the drift velocity. And there is a new term, uh, which is the diffusive term, which is what uh, would normally be called something like the osmotic current. So we have a drift current and we have an osmotic current, very much like you would expect in diffusion. 
the pieces of the current that come from this log row uh, are what we would normally call Fick's law, uh, but now in the space of uh, 3n dimensions in configuration space. So, so this is just rewriting the original equation in this uh, more interesting or well, in this different way. But there is yet a third way that we can write this equation that's actually very suggestive. In the third way of writing this equation, we ask the question, could it possibly be that this Fokker-Planck equation can be written as the functional derivative of a Hamiltonian function? And uh, actually, the, the issue is straightforward. Can we find an H tilde such that this equation here at the bottom reproduces the Fokker-Planck equation? And the answer is yes. You just uh, substitute this guy over there. It's a first order differential equation, functional, but no, it's not a problem. You can just find what the answer is. Fairly straightforward. Uh, there may be, the, I'm taking derivatives with respect to phi here. Uh, and so there may be integrations of, const, uh, of motion, constants of the integral that we have to find later. But uh, here we have, we have something that looks pretty much like Hamiltonian. And we would be inclined to say that phi is the momentum conjugate to rho if only we had a second Hamilton equation. Very good. So what do we have here? We have Brownian motions. We have diffusion, but we do not have quantum mechanics yet. So in order to make this entropic dynamics into something that smells like quantum mechanics, we might be able to want to ask, like in the spirit of where is the second Hamilton equation, if you have constraints given in terms of these potentials, how do you update not just the probabilities? The potentials tell you how you update the probabilities. But now we would like to update the potentials themselves. So. Where's that second Hamilton equation come from? And so this is where we enter the realm of something that starts smelling more and more like quantum mechanics. Uh, we started with the positions of particles, which are continuous, the continuous microstates of our problem. In order to simplify the notation, and make the, the argument somewhat uh, easier to follow, I'm going to switch to discrete variables. Uh, and then later, we'll come back to, to the, 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 the distributions of particles with continuous variables and all that. But it's easier now, uh, just for the question of the issue of notation, to talk about discrete variables. Let's call the variables that we're talking about something like j, which can take n values. Uh, and uh, the, for example, we could imagine that we're talking about an n-sided die. Uh, the probabilities are epistemic, Bayesian, but not, not uh, personalistic. They are closer to the spirit uh, of what uh, James would have uh, said about probabilities. Uh, we're going to talk the probability of the uh, j side of the die as rho with an upper index j, which is something that uh, might indicate to you that I'm really trying to talk about differential geometry, and these are going to be generalized coordinates. Our goal is going to study curves on the n minus one dimensional simplex. So here we have a statistical manifold. Each point on this simplex represents a whole probability distribution. And we want to study curves on the simplex of normalized probabilities. So here it is. Here's the simplex. Um, all rows that are positive and add up to 1. And, uh, and we're just studying curves here. This is uh, 
This is just the kinematical component of an actual dynamics. What kind of curves uh, does it make sense to consider if you have a statistical manifold, a space of probability distributions? Very good. Uh, let's remind ourselves of some geometry. Um, this is just to set the stage for it is that I'm trying to do. I'm sure that this is all very familiar to, to all of you. Uh, suppose here you have the simplex, the statistical manifold. Uh, a point in this statistical manifold is a whole probability distribution. Uh, it will be the epistemic configuration space. There is an ontic configuration space. That's what the particles are doing, the positions of the particles. And now there is an epistemic configuration space, which is the space of probabilities. We are interested in curves here. These are trajectories of the probabilities. We are also interested in velocities, tangent vectors. So the space of tangent vectors, and here we have like a potential mm, velocity vector, uh, that's the tangent space at the point rho. And uh, if you take into account the whole set of tangent spaces, that's the tangent bundle. All right, standard material, except for the fact that I'm talking about differential uh, statistical manifolds. Uh, but we're not just interested in curves, we're also interested in functions. And uh, to each point rho, we can associate the for example, the gradients of those functions and those uh, co-vectors form the cotangent space at rho. Standard material, the cotangent bundle will be the base manifold, the simplex, plus all of the cotangent spaces. So the big question is, okay, what are those co-vectors? In classical mechanics, The covectors are just the momenta and they're given by derivatives of the Lagrangian. But here we do not have a Lagrangian. So we have to, to do something else. And at this point, I'm just going to say there will be covectors. Uh, of course, we want to make the covectors uh, make the connection to those drift potentials that uh, I had been talking to uh, about before. Uh, but we'll just proceed by saying that not only we have rho, and we have these phi's. And uh, it is this cotangent bundle that's going to form the epistemic phase space. This is the, the phase space in which the whole dynamics will happen. Very good. Uh, once we have rho and we have phi, uh, we can actually well improve the notation a little bit and say, well, a point in this phase space in the epistemic phase space is given by rho and phi. Um, the, the coordinates of this point x will be given by a composite index. Alpha denotes rho and phi, one and two denotes rho and phi, and j just denotes which particular probability and its phase we're talking about. Vectors are expressed in the usual way. The components of such vectors are mm, velocities or derivatives of the phi's. And uh, okay, here I'm going to do the first of, uh, I mean, I'm going to introduce a little trick here, which is that of course, as I do this, there will be a number of technicalities and I'm going to just skim over them. Some of them I'll tell you so that you know that there is more coming. Uh, an important technicality is that these probabilities are normalized. And that is a pain in the neck. Uh, so one of the things that we're going to do, and I'm not going to explain it too much, is uh, enlarge, embed the space from the space of normalized probabilities, the simplex, into the space of, instead of n minus one dimensions, n dimensions. Just go one, one dimension higher, it makes life much easier. Uh, perfectly doable, but it requires uh, keeping track of details. So here we go. Uh, we're going to talk about the enlarged space of unnormalized probabilities now. Uh, 
uh, among other things, it's the kind of thing that allows us to take uh, partial derivatives without having to worry too much. Very good. Uh, so we have a notation for points and, and we have this composite index notation here. And so now we can actually say, if you have a cotangent bundle and you have a privileged set of coordinates on this bundle, then we can naturally write down a symplectic form. So the symplectic form is going to be some kind of anti-symmetric tensor. Uh, the tilde just means that uh, these are derivatives in the, um, in the cotangent bundle, uh, as opposed to just being derivatives on the, on the simplex, on the base manifold, or derivatives in the ontic configuration space. There are several spaces here. So on this cotangent bundle, we can define the symplectic form. We can apply this tensor on vectors. And we can rewrite that in terms of components. And when we do that, the components of the symplectic form are very nice. Uh, they take the usual anti-symmetric form, they're constants and they're local. Uh, so it's a very simple uh, structure being introduced here by virtue of the fact that we have these privileged coordinates, the probabilities and uh, they are associated um, and, and the quantities that came from the constraints. Very good. Now it will start looking more like physics. Those curves, those congruences of curves on the statistical manifold uh, with tangent vectors h, uh, such that the Lie derivative of omega vanishes are called Hamiltonian flows. Standard material in classical mechanics, vector fields that preserve with the flow, they preserve the symplectic structure are called Hamiltonian flows. The significance of this or comes from the fact that due to Poincare's lemma associated to the vector field h bar, there exists a scalar function, h tilde, such that the, along the flow, the change of the rows and of the phi's is given by Hamilton's equations. So imposing that the symplectic form be preserved along the flow given by the congruence h, uh, is equivalent to Hamilton's equations. We do not need to impose physics to do this. We basically have to ask, here we have a cotangent bundle with some privileged coordinates. Uh, what are the nice curves we can write on this space? And those are given by Hamilton's equations. Furthermore, if we take two of these Hamiltonian vector fields and apply to them the symplectic form, then that can be written in terms of the Poisson brackets of the associated scalar functions. So, so what this means is that by imposing that the Lie derivative of omega along this privileged family of curves, uh, which is the ones that make omega be preserved, uh, we reproduce this, the, the, the mathematics of classical mechanics. But there is another, uh, there is another uh, interesting structure floating around that we do not have when we have classical mechanics. And that is the fact that the statistical manifolds have also a metric structure. Once, once you have a statistical manifold, you can always ask if you have two probability distributions that are close together, uh, can you distinguish them or not? And uh, the, the only way to try to distinguish two neighboring or establish a, a measure of distinguishability of two neighboring probability distributions is basically information geometry. The, there is a, 
since, since we are dealing with statistical manifolds, there is a natural metric, a natural line element there. This, the metric tensor, G, uh, is basically a second derivative of the entropy, of the relative entropy. Uh, and we can write down an expression for it. Uh, what makes it particularly significant is that it is universal. It doesn't matter if you're using Salis entropies, Rennie entropies, just regular log entropies. It's, it's always going to be given by the same formula. And uh, in this particular case for the simplex, we have something that takes a particularly simple form, uh, except for this quantity B up here. Uh, it's going to be something that, well, it just takes that form. I know what it is. Uh, pardon, Ariel. So this yes. is the uh, Fisher information metric? Correct. Yes. This is the exactly, Fisher information. That, that's exactly okay. what it is. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Thank um, so very good. Uh, uh, there is a, uh, you can see my star there. My, the star there once again indicates that there is a fair amount of additional fine print to writing down this particular formula here. This is the formula that applies to the statistical manifold of normalized probabilities. When you go to the statistical manifold of unnormalized probabilities that may be extra terms that however will turn out to be irrelevant for the sequence of arguments. So I'm not even going to write them down here. Very good. So now uh, the simplex is a statistical manifold. It has a metric. The cotangent bundle, the epistemic phase space is not a statistical manifold anymore. It might or might not have a metric. So what we're going to assume here is we want to assign a metric to the phase space, to the cotangent bundle, that is the simplest possible that you can do in the sense that it only depends on the metric of the simplex. And we're going to say this, look, if you have, let's write down the, uh, the length element for the cotangent bundle, for the phase space, here it is. And we're gonna say, if you have displacements uh, in the simplex direction on the statistical manifold, you should reproduce what you have before. When you have displacements that are just happening on the fibers, we are going to say, well, yes, these delta phi's here, they are covectors. The natural inner product is going to be given in terms of the inverse of this metric tensor. Simplest thing we're doing, we're just defining or introducing the metric of the phase space by saying it depends only on the information geometry of the statistical manifold. Um, once again, there is more stuff to be said there that could be mixed terms. And uh, we can, for good physical reasons, uh, get rid of them. But I won't discuss that any further. This is the simplest that you can possibly write down. Very good, we have a metric here. Um, let me see. Yes, that metric uh, may depend on this on this object here, B. And uh, it is at this point that we're going to say this constant here, B, that uh, basically just measures units. Um, we're going to call that H bar. You'll see in a second why that may be uh, interesting. Here, H bar appears in the metric. Here, it appears uh, in the inverse metric. So let's see. Uh, as I was saying before, since the particular embedding into the space, the cotangent bundle of unnormalized probabilities does not matter, and, and this requires explanation, uh, we're going to choose this cotangent bundle to be flat. Since it, that doesn't matter, we can choose it many things. Uh, we'll choose it to be flat. This, of course, will at some point, and I'm not going to have time to discuss this, is the, the, it's very significant because the fact that this space being flat turns out to be what we normally call Hilbert spaces. Uh, at this point, it's just a flat cotangent bundle. The metric tensor takes this particular form. See here the first part that came from the metric tensor of the statistical manifold with an H. Here we have its inverse with an one over H. And this is 
an interesting uh, feature of this formalism. It tells you something about the physical meaning of H bar in the entropic dynamics approach. It is a weight that tells you the relative uh, importance, the relative weights for the line element uh, of the base manifold and of the cotangent spaces, the fibers. That's where H comes in in this, in this picture. Once we have our metric tensor, the line element, we can write the line element in terms of mm, components of the metric, just standard stuff, standard differential geometry. But we can do something very interesting here. You see, once you have a metric tensor and it's inverse, you can use these tensors to raise and lower indices. You can map from vectors to covectors and the other way around. So I'm going to do something interesting here, which is that if you take the symplectic form, which defines the symplectic geometry of the cotangent bundle, and you raise the, uh, the, the, the first index, you raise one of those indices, you get another tensor. Just, you just raise an index, no biggie. Uh, this is a tensor, the tensor J is a tensor that maps vectors to vectors. Both G and omega map vectors to covectors and vice versa. Uh, very good. Why is it that this interest, this tensor here might be interesting? Oh, here, yeah, yeah. I wrote down what the expression would be for this particular tensor here. Uh, but why is it that this tensor would be interesting? The reason this tensor is interesting is, is that if you take its square, if you make j act on a vector and then act again with j, what you get is minus one. Which means that we have a complex structure floating around. The moment that you have a symplectic structure and you have a metric structure, you automatically have a complex structure. We are talking about a Kähler manifold. Um, It is a strange Kähler manifold, or rather a somewhat different Kähler manifold, uh, in the in the sense that the inform the geometry, the metric geometry, came from information geometry. But nevertheless, it is a Kähler manifold. This is what gives rise to complex projective uh, structures. Very good. Uh, if you have a complex structure then this suggests immediately the introduction of complex coordinates, something like this. We introduce psi, the wave function, as being a complex coordinate. Psi star, the complex conjugates of psi, would be the, the canonically conjugate momentum to the, to the wave function. And we can actually show that the transformation from the original row phi to the new psi, psi star coordinates is actually canonical. Uh, so we can do this. So this is what explains the introduction of complex numbers in quantum mechanics. It is not merely a matter of convenience. There is an underlying complex structure that comes from a symplectic and a metric structure altogether. Very good. What are the curves that we're interested in discussing on this uh, cotangent bundle, on this phase space. We have originally seen that you get Hamiltonian dynamics if you impose the preservation of the symplectic form. What we would like to do now is, in addition, impose the preservation of the metric form. Uh, these are the doubly special congruences we can invent on this manifold. So we're going to be discussing not just Hamilton flows, that preserve omega, but also killing flows that preserve G. How do we do this? Well, at this point, the way to preserve also the, uh, well, the way to preserve the symplectic form is to have some Hamiltonian. The way to preserve the metric tensor is in addition to impose conditions on that Hamiltonian. And when we try to figure out what those conditions 
R, we get something very simple. It's namely just that the second derivatives of H vanish, which means that H must be some bilinear function. Uh, once again, there is more fine print in this that could in principle be linear terms, but if you consider the subtleties of normalization and, and all that, you find out that those linear terms have to vanish. So the Hamiltonian is bilinear. And with this, we basically finish the theory. It's finished. We cannot read what it is we've written, but it, the, the whole formalism is taken care of. The Hamilton killing flow that comes from this bilinear Hamiltonian is given by Hamilton's equations. Here are Hamilton's equations written uh, in Poisson bracket form. And uh, when you actually just figure out what they are, what you obtain is something like this, which is the linear Schrodinger equation. So the linearity of the Schrodinger equation is a consequence of having imposed both the preservation of the symplectic structure and the preservation of the metric structure coming from information geometry. We are now ready to, oh yes, uh, I, should, I should say this, this is important, or rather, whatever it is. The, <clears throat> the fact that quantum mechanics has a symplectic structure and a metric structure has been known and, and could be written in terms of Hamilton's equations, for example. This has been known, let me, let me put it differently. This has been discovered and forgotten and rediscovered many times. Uh, Kibble, Heslot, Ashtika, and Schilling, these are all just of the participants in this discovery and rediscovery process. What all of these people did was they, they looked at quantum mechanics and they did verify that indeed, well, quantum mechanics has an inner product. It must have some kind of metric structure. You can separate the inner product into symmetric and anti-symmetric parts. You can do things like So what these people did was they realized that quantum mechanics has interesting structures that are sort of hiding underneath. What I've done is somewhat different. Instead of starting from a given quantum mechanics and figured out what structures it has, uh, what I did was I started from structures coming from somewhere else, namely from information geometry and statistical manifolds, and derive the quantum mechanics. Of course, it did help me a lot to read Kibble and Heslot and Ashtekar and Schilling. Very good. So now, now that we have uh, the preservation of these structures giving us a linear Schrodinger equation, let's get back to particles and continuous variables. The Hamilton killing flow that preserves both structures requires a Hamiltonian that is bilinear. But nothing in the theory that we have described so far, now that we're talking about symplectic and metric structures, singles out a particular congruence of curves as being something that has anything to do with time. Uh, we would like to be, have choose this bilinear Hamiltonian. In particular, we would like to be able to choose this kernel that appears here. We would like to choose it in such a way that it reproduces the continuity equation of entropic dynamics, the Fokker-Planck equation, and it generates an evolution in what we earlier called entropic time. If you now impose that this, Hamilton, this Hamiltonian really reproduce the original Fokker-Planck equation, then you obtain something that may start to really look familiar. Uh, here we have the inverse mass tensor. So this is H squared over 2M. And uh, if you now compute what the Hamilton equation that comes from this Hamiltonian is, uh, what you get is the Schrodinger equation. And this is basically the end. I would like to end with just a quick summary now and say, well, remember that I said it originally when I was trying to figure out how to accumulate short steps, I'm going to invent a notion of time. I'll call it entropic time because I have absolutely no idea how this might actually be connected to physical time. 
Well, now we have an answer. Once we have figured out that the equations, the congruences on these statistical manifolds and phase spaces, the congruences are going to be such that they obey the Schrodinger equation. If we calibrate our clocks according to the Schrodinger equation, then the T that appears here that was entropic time is basically what you're measuring when you measure with clocks. So entropic time is as physical as it gets in the sense that it's what you measure with clocks that obey Schrodinger's equation. The H that we introduced the earlier uh, as, as, as some kind of weight between the, the length elements as computed on the base space and as computed on the fibers on the cotangent bundles, uh, fund, uh, spaces, that uh, those H's are now recognized to be indeed truly the, the Planck equation. And of course, those M's that were constants introduced just in Lagrange multipliers, those M's are now recognized as massive. So to summarize, entropic dynamics is very conservative in the sense that it achieves ontological clarity. Probabilities are fully epistemic. There is no need for quantum probabilities. Only positions are ontic. Now, this is very strange, particularly the ontic. All other observables are epistemic. And this means that momenta and energies and angular momentum and all of those other observables we have in quantum mechanics, they're not ontic properties of the particle. Really, those end up being epistemic properties of the wave functions. Particles in this approach do not have a momentum. It is the wave function that has momenta and magnitudes, all right? Probabilities have their own momenta, but particles do not. Mm, strange. So it is very conservative. It achieves a clear ontological separation. But then entropic dynamics is radically non-classical in the sense that it denies the ontic status of dynamics. Dynamics in this approach is something that happens purely at the, on, at the epistemic level. We have a dynamics of probabilities, not a dynamics of particles. The quantum mechanics we described here follows, of course, from mm, probabilities being updated through entropies. But then you have to update the constraints. The cotangent bundle allows us to write down a symplectic structure. From information geometry, we get a metric structure. From those two, we get complex numbers. The dynamics that preserves all of these very geometric structures is that of Hamilton killing flows, which leads to classical Hamilton's equations, but classical, not in the sense of Hamilton's equations applied to particles, but Hamilton's equations applied to probabilities. And this is, of course, the linear Schrodinger equation. Very good. Conclusion. Entropic dynamics is a viable, realist psi-epistemic model of quantum mechanics. Realist in the sense that the particles have real positions. Psi-epistemic in the sense that psi is very much something at the epistemic level. Uh, for more details, I invite you to visit uh, my website where there are a bunch of papers and lectures and things like that. Uh, and where, among other things, papers have accumulated over the years on how do we handle the measurement. You see, you see the issue is when you come up with some crazy idea like this, uh, it's not enough to say, oh, yes, I got this piece of quantum mechanics. You have to be very careful to try to reproduce as much as possible. So the measurement problem, how entropic dynamics evades no-go theorems such as Bell's or um, PVS or Hardy or something. Where do you get uncertainty relations? How do you get the classical limit? How do you discuss spin? Quantum field theory in curve space time, quantum field theory coupled to gravity. So there you can have papers on, on that. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Ariel, for a very interesting talk. Um, let's open. Uh...
uh, discussion uh, part. I think uh, Professor Ivo Białonicki Birula was the first, and then Professor Jerzy Kijowski. So, Professor Białonicki Birula, please. You have to unmute your microphone. Yes, yes. You mentioned at the beginning a relation to the Royal Pilot Wave Theory. And I'm afraid that you're. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. What theory? Pilot, pilot wave of the Broil. Oh, yes, yes, yes. I'm afraid that it suffers from the same weakness, namely, there is no relativistic generalization of this approach for the following reason. Positions in relativistic physics, even the, the simplest case of the Dirac equation, lose their meaning that they have in non-relativistic physics. I completely agree with you. Yes, that's why I, I put this last slide here saying, uh, Yes, you cannot just claim you have derived non-relativistic quantum mechanics and, and just declare victory. You have to actually go ahead and say, okay, how do you do quantum fields in relativistic physics, in particular in curved space-time? And even, how do you even couple that to gravity? Yes, it's absolutely crucial to keep going. Without, Unless we get all the way to the standard model, one cannot claim victory. You're right, yes. Uh, okay, um, uh, Professor Kijowski, please. Obiecałem Iwonie, że będę i będę. Zadałem pytanie. First of all, I agree with uh, the statement by Professor Gawinicki, because uh, if you take a current background, then uh, po positions at a diff on a different Cauchy surface are just highly nonlinear combinations of positions at momenta I... in the previous. Okay, but this is just a <laughs> remark. I'd like to say the following, that uh, as you mentioned, the observation that uh, Schrodinger equation may, can be uh, treated as a classical Hamiltonian system is, uh, of course, known uh, already on <laughs> almost 100 years ago, in poor uh, language, you may say that the um, imaginary part of, of the wave function plays role of the momentum canonically conjugate to the real part of wave function. However, what is less known is that also any classical field theory which means, for, for example, just wave equation or uh, Maxwell electrodynamics or linear gravity may also be translated, translated in an opposite direction. And for instance, Maxwell equations is nothing but the collection of two uh, Schrodinger equations. And this is also true. So it works in both directions. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I agree with you, and uh, to the first remark, uh, I will insist, uh, if you want to have a relativistic theory of this type, you do not formulate it in terms of particles, you formulate it in terms of quantum fields. Those would be the ontic objects there. So when you formulate them that way, what you end up getting is a functional Schrodinger equation, uh, and it works fine. Uh, as far as uh, being capable of uh, reproducing classical mechanics in terms of formulations like uh, a Hamiltonian approach uh, or something that resembles and includes killer spaces. Well, yes, Koopman did that back in the 1930s and uh, it's good stuff. What we're trying here is in making sure that we understand where the structures needed to reproduce quantum mechanics, where are they coming from? And that's why this last slide here continues to be very, very relevant. You cannot just say, oh, I derived the non-relativistic Schrodinger equation, I'm happy. You have to say where it is that you have Bell, Bell, Bell's theorem and all the other theorems, how you deal with measurement, uncertainty relations, and so on uh, and so forth. Okay, um, any more questions maybe from, from the room D? Is there anyone? I can see two people. Yes, so, yes. 
yes, yes. Please, okay. please go ahead. Please go ahead, guys. Whoever is first. Oliver is muted. Ah, okay. I can ask. I thought I was not first, but I can ask first if you like. Um, I don't know. Pardon, 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 Oliver. The first were the guys from the room. Ah, sure, sure. There, there are two people in in the room who wanted to ask question. So whoever of you is first, please go ahead. So probably me. <laughs> in in the theory of dynamical system, you also have the uh, you have dynamical entropy. Entropy is different for different system. If you choose a Bernoulli dynamic system, your entropy will be maximum. Uh, and all these steps will be uh, uncorrelated. And if you look at the, I'm not specialist in, in this theory, but I uh, like look through this book, and I understood that starting from dynamical system, you can uh, also, as a next step, introduce flows, introduce metrical spaces, and also uh, in terms of uh, uh, functional analysis, you introduce complex number and uh, um, um, and then what I want to see, and then after all you can because it's uh, Hamiltonian dynamic is introducing a logic theory from probability then uh, if if you end up with uh, Hydrodynamic equations, and you can give them the way, the form of Schrodinger equation. It's not because it's, uh, from Schrodinger you can derive uh, um, hydrodynamics. From hydrodynamics you just split variables and you derive Schrodinger. So I'm just asking you: Do you do you have do you see any analogies from just uh, Following the way the ergodic theory derived all the flaws and everything. I have not looked into possible analogies with ergodic theory. Uh, however, however, uh, the fact that hydrodynamical uh, interpretations of quantum mechanics were proposed already back in the 1920s by, by Madelung and then several other people. Uh, that's an indication that it, it, is, it is possible to establish analogies between these, these kinds of equations rather simply. Uh, what might not be so simple to do is the recognition that if one starts from probabilities, there are metric structures, namely given by information geometry, the Fisher metric and, and entropies, that are uh, essential, in my view, uh, to the derivation of quantum mechanics. Uh, rather than taking the, just the equations and trying to uh, massage them and append an interpretation, we are putting the whole theory on its head here, and we are starting from an interpretation and building the mathematical theory. Uh, apart from that, uh, the other thing that I would say is that there is something very peculiar about any attempt to reconstruct quantum mechanics, which is that if you happen to be more or less successful, all these different approaches to reconstructed quantum mechanics at some point have to converge onto the Schrodinger equation, right? So they start looking more and more and more similar. Of course, we, if, if, you, if you don't get the Schrodinger equation at the end, you're going to disagree with experiment. So everybody who tries to reconstruct quantum mechanics and ends up producing theories that at some point start looking similar. Uh, I think that that's partly what's going on. Everything looks a little bit similar <laughs> mathematically. The interpretations, however, are very uh -huh. different. Uh -huh. OK. OK, thank you very much. So uh, since we are running out of time, please uh, ask uh, your questions uh, mm, uh, to I the point even... and in a fast uh, way, because as far as I understand, there is a Christmas event in about 15 minutes. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so so, please, uh, there, was, <laughs> there, was, uh, there was one more question from, uh, yes, from the audience. Hello, Rzeczkowski, can you hear me? Sure, everybody can hear you. <laughs> it's, it's a little bit garbled, but try me. 
Okay, so I understood your approach. You at the beginning to pure states or classical probability distributions, and you got this feature like metric. But if you generalize it, is it feasible to generalize this approach to density matrices? The question is simple. Which metric discounts in the state of density matrices you will get? And then going to dynamics, can you treat in a similar way, not Schrodinger equation, but let's say Lindblad equation in the space of density matrices? Okay, very good question. Yes, this is something that I have worried a fair amount. It's definitely true that once we get to the Schrodinger equation, nothing prevents us from introducing density matrices in the standard way, okay? The one problem that I would have with introducing density matrices at the very beginning, before the whole formalism has been derived, is that you have absolutely no in indication of why it is that you should be using complex numbers, Hilbert spaces, anything of the sort. Density matrices are defined on Hilbert spaces. So once we have the Schrodinger equation and we can introduce Hilbert spaces, then yes, you can actually do the standard approach and proceed. Before, I would not have the arguments. Now, of course, I would love to if I had, but mm, I don't. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, Oliver, I think Oliver, you were, you were next, please go uh, ahead. Sure, so I, I have a very stupid question, which is, um, at least in finite dimensions, it's quite well known that if I have a, say if I look at 2n by 2n dimensional linear maps and I require, and I look at the subgroup, which is um, orthogonal and symplectic at the same time, then these guys end up being, uh, well, essentially exactly the same as the n-dimensional unitary group, right? Is that the Co same as what's that, happening? That's absolutely correct. That's exactly true. That was the first indication I had, or rather what gave me the hint. I read that in Arnold's book. Yeah, uh, that was the in the first indication I had that I had to take symplectic structures and orthogonal structures uh, seriously. <laughs> okay, where do the orthogonal groups come in into this picture? It turns out that the information geometry of the simplex is that of a section of a sphere. You have natural spherical symmetries going on. When you take the information geometry of the simplex, which is a sphere, and you try to embed it in the space of unnormalized probabilities, the most general metric that you can write on those space of unnormalized probabilities, what I called S plus, uh, is spherical symmetry. Once again, it's not flat. Flat is a special kind of spherical symmetry. It's a special kind of embedding. But in general, you can go for uh, arbitrary spherically symmetric spaces. All those technicalities that I was talking about normalization, how it is that things become easier if you go to a larger space of unnormalized probabilities, they all have to do with the spherical symmetries of these embedding spaces. But you're totally right. Yes. So my, my actual question, I apologize, my actual question, if I, can, if I can ask very quickly, is yeah. um, does this thing still work in infinite dimensions? Like, because um, you start to talk about particles and you you want to think about things in position. So yeah. is it still true that if I have a uh, orthogonal and symplectic dynamics in unitary, in, sorry, in infinite dimensional Hubble space, I still get I a unitary know. thing? You don't I know. never okay. used it. I never okay. used it here when I did particles. In fact, mm -hmm. all of this was discovered first in the continuous realm, and I never, I never really bothered too much about spherical symmetries. Mm -hmm. uh, I suspect it will work, but yeah, I didn't know. need it. <laughs> I didn't need it. Once you just have use your regular differential geometry for, for symplectic forms and metric tensors in close vanishing lead derivatives, the whole thing just drops off very nicely. Okay, thank you very thank much. You. We, I'm afraid we have to finish, Ariel. Thank you very much for your time, for the talk, for the discussion. Merry uh, Christmas to you all. Thank you, thank have you, thank time. you. The same to you. Bye-bye. Oh,